Well, hello everybody and welcome. It's great to see such a, a full house. This is Foreign Affairs Live's presidential debate viewing party hosted by Foreign Affairs. I'm Jonathan Tepperman. I'm uh, the managing editor of uh, the magazine and I'll be the moderator of tonight's event. Before we hear from uh, President Obama and Mitt Romney, we're going to whet your appetites for political combat with a little debate of our own. We've invited a crack panel of political analysts to help represent the two sides. They have generously volunteered to act as proxies. I told them they didn't have to. They chose to be anyways. Um, so you can feel free to grill them on absolutely anything. Uh, I certainly will. In um, the right corner, uh, we have Dan Dresner. Dan is a professor of international politics, a full professor, he wanted me to note, at Tufts <laughs> Fletcher School and uh, is also a blogger, a prolific blogger at a, a certain magazine <laughs> whose name cannot be mentioned in these parts. Um, Dan also has a special qualification to be here tonight. Um, we figured that nobody could be better uh, representing um, a candidate who's often uh, accused of being a rhino, uh, a Republican in name only, than a pundit who's always tarred with the same brush. Um, then again, Dan, is it even fair to call you a rhino these days, or are you more like a, a renino, a, a Republican not even in name only? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Or are you waiting for the election to decide? No, I'm a Republican. Okay. Yeah. In, the, uh, in the left corner, I'm proud to introduce Rachel Kleinfeld. Rachel is the founding uh, president of the Truman National Security Project, which runs many programs, including a fellowship, a fellowship which is so prestigious and so exclusive, I might add, that when I applied six or seven years ago, I was rejected. <laughs> Among her other roles, uh, Rachel <laughs> serves on the US State Department's Foreign Policy Advisory Board. Now, uh, let's get down to it. The rules for tonight's pre-debate debate have been set by the nonpartisan Commission on Pre-Presidential Debate Debates. <laughs> that commission consists exclusively of me, uh, so let me tell you how I've determined that things should work. I'm going to start by asking Dan and Rachel a few questions. The questions will be generally directed at one or the other, um, but in the interest of fairness, the other party will get a chance to respond uh, if they feel it's necessary. However, um, if the participants go over their allotted time, uh, which will be determined arbitrarily by me, I reserve the right to squirt them with my water gun. <laughs> Take that, Jim Lehrer. After 20 or 30 minutes, I'm going to open things up to questions from the floor. Uh, please, when I do uh, wait to be called on, uh, stand, uh, wait for the microphone, stand, state your name, and if appropriate, your affiliation. Please limit yourself to one short question. Note the word there, question. Do they have um, to use a Long Island accent? Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, if you do not uh, limit yourself to a question, I also reserve the right to uh, squirt you with my water pistol. Finally, one housekeeping note, um, feel free to follow along and tweet to your heart's content at hashtag uh, FA Live, but please make sure to silence your mobile devices. If you fail to do so, I reserve the right to squirt you with my water pistol. <laughs> so my first question is actually for both uh, Dan and Rachel, uh, and it's a simple one. Given that Americans tend to completely ignore the rest of the world, um, and that debates tend in normal campaigns not to make uh, a much difference, does tonight really matter? And given the problem that you, you can't win a campaign by talking about foreign policy, how can the candidates actually score points uh, and win in tonight's debate? Rachel, let's start with you. Um, sure, well thank you first of all, and thank all of you. I had not expected a full house for foreign policy affairs discussions anywhere about foreign affairs magazine. So thrilled to be here. These are in the room, I think, all the voters in the United States who actually vote <laughs> on foreign policy. <laughs> vote on well, I'm happy 5%. to say that while very, very few people do vote on foreign policy, a lot of people vote on character. Um, the Truman Project actually does a lot of teaching on this. And the statistics are really remarkable about how much people care about the character of their leader in foreign policy decisions. Because of course, you don't know what's going to come up in foreign policy. And so all you really have to go on is what type of person is in front of you, what kind of judgment do they have. 
And so there is kind of a gut check test, a, a judgment. Is this person a commander in chief? What do the decisions do they make when confronted with an unknown? And most voters are looking for, does this person represent me in a way where if I knew what they knew, when they know it, I would make that sort of decision. And so their judgment calls in this debate would really matter, I think, and the character that they present to the American people. Dan? Now would ordinarily be the time where I thank Foreign Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations for inviting me, but in this case, I'm going to lodge a formal protest at this time. I was originally invited under the expectation this was just going to be a small affair involving CFR members, and I didn't even know who the other person was going to be. I was not aware that this was going to be on television uh, with Rachel, because as anyone knows, the way this works is that the winner of the debate is whoever performs better visually. Now. <laughs> By CFR standards, I thought I could have pulled that off. I mean, my, my tie matches my shirt. I don't have completely gray hair. I thought I was going to rock this. And now I have to compete against Rachel. So already I've lost the debate. And, I'm and a little notice upset. the classic strategy of lowering expectations, exactly. by the way. Very well done. But I will agree with Rachel that I think um, the, the foreign policy debate in this case matters for a couple of reasons. The first is that if you haven't noticed, the race is pretty close. And so in this you know, sort of environment, anything can potentially tip the scales. And there's, there could be one of those moments that's replayed over and over again. Uh, it's worth remembering, for example, in 1976, when Gerald Ford insisted that Poland was not a part of the Warsaw Pact. That was uh, not a, a great moment for him. Um, and I would agree with Rachel also that you know, foreign policy is a, you know, potentially one area where you can test character. It's also probably a place where you can test leadership. What Americans want right now is to see someone who can actually you know, command leadership both domestically and at the global stage. And we're in one of those periods in the world where it looks like America is reacting to events rather than potentially making events and potentially trying to frame things in a way that advances the national interest. And so that might be an arena where, you know, if you, can, if you want to see whether or not your candidate is going to be able to do that, either based on the past four years or based on the campaign, you know, that, that resonates with voters, not just in terms of molding the economy, but also molding the rest of the world. So let me ask you a follow-up question, Dan. On the surface, this debate seems like it might pose a real challenge for Romney uh, for several reasons. One, like it or not, and wherever you stand on the issues, Obama has a pretty good record on foreign policy. Um, two, uh, Romney has had a habit of saying some pretty boneheaded things about the rest of the world, especially on the rare occasions when he's allowed to travel. Um, and three, <laughs> Other than carping on Obama for being weak, he hasn't thus far managed to articulate very specifically how he'd do things differently in many places, whether it's Iran, Afghanistan, or Syria, et cetera, except for some minor differences at the margin. So the question is, what does his approach need to be tonight? How does he show he has a positive vision for leading the world? Well, I would say the following. I actually think that had this debate been held six weeks ago, I would agree with your assessment of how things uh, would play out. And you're absolutely right. If you look at the poll numbers, you know, foreign policy was clearly an area where Obama seemed to be doing much better uh, than Romney. But uh, in the last six weeks, a couple of things have happened. The first is the Benghazi attack, which is obviously unfortunate, um, but also the Obama administration's handling of it, which has not been great, um, and has called attention to the fact that, you know, Obama had campaigned, at least in terms of foreign policy, for most of the campaign on the notion that he was the competent one. And oh, by the way, in case you didn't know, he ordered Osama bin Laden to be killed. Um, and you know that, and, and all credit is due there. But what the Benghazi attack has done, and also I would add the way the, the debate topics have been chosen for tonight, um, you know, four out of the six are dealing with the greater Middle East. And this is not an arena now where Obama necessarily has that much of a strength. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at his Afghanistan policy, it's not, you know, it, it, it doesn't look that great. Um, you know, you look at uh, Iran, I mean, I, there I think there will be some interesting give and take. Um, and then with the Arab Spring, again, it's one of those instances where potentially Obama looks a little more passive. I think what Romney needs to do is, I agree with you, he needs to restrain, he, he needs to, you know, act presidential, which means you can't go in attack dog mode. That's not what Americans like to see in terms of foreign policy. I think he actually does need to seem presidential. I don't think voters necessarily vote entirely based on foreign policy, but I do think there is an, sort of a bar <coughs> above which you want you know, to vote in terms of your candidate. In other words, can you see this person being the leader of the free world? Mm -hmm. um, and so Romney, you know, if you think about it, in the first debate, Romney did an outstanding job of sort of presenting himself as Massachusetts Mitt mm -hmm. rather than severely conservative Mitt. Um, it wouldn't shock me if you see something along those lines with this debate. But do you think we'll hear specific proposals as opposed to mere criticism? Um, I don't think so, mostly because Anyone who tries to suggest specific policy proposals in foreign policy prior to an election is mm -hmm. guaranteed to curse themselves that 
after the election, they will immediately have to go back on those right. promises. I actually think the most interesting thing about this is that uh, there's actually been polls conducted of Romney supporters, and a majority of Romney supporters don't believe, for example, that Mitt Romney is going to label China a currency manipulator on day one, which I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, to be fair, it should be pointed out that Barack Obama did not renegotiate NAFTA, which he pledged to do you know, right. in the 2008 campaign. So specific p campaign promises on foreign policy rarely, if ever, actually get honored once they're elected. So uh, Rachel, a, a parallel question about Obama. Um, this is a guy who came into office um, four years ago on the back of some very lofty rhetoric about what he was going to do um, with America's place in the world. He was going to change the tenor of US foreign policy. He was going to reset relations with Russia. He was going <clears> to <throat> um, excuse me, usher in a new era of global non-proliferation. Instead, he has governed like a cautious realist. Uh, cautious, cautious realist, eschewing grand um, policy rhetoric and big gestures in favor of careful crisis management. Now, um, that may be, and in fact I would argue it probably is, the mature grown-up way to run the world's sole superpower. But the, the problem for Obama is it doesn't make for great campaign copy. So what can Obama do to get beyond arguing for simply more of the same and present some version of the inspiring positive vision that he did four years ago. Sure. Well, as everyone knows, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose, right. and that's not nearly as fun. And as every general knows, your strategy just disappears at the moment of conf contact with battle. Sure. And he's dealing with both of those problems right now. I think um, he actually has had some very important overarching strategy, which he presented very nicely at the Nobel Prize speech. Um, he's got an idea of the world as a place in which non-state actors, people like terrorists, have many, many more cards in their hands than they used to. And so what does that mean? He's trying to limit nuclear weapons, which he's done a very decent job at, actually. He's been trying to um, get his hand around terrorist issues with the drone attacks and so on, which he's been ordering at a much, much higher rate. So his strategy of trying to keep terrorists on the run, keeping America from getting tied down, keeping us a more nimble power that can move from, from area to area rather than being stuck and mired in, for instance, the Middle East, which keeps getting brought up. These are strategic points. They're not just crisis management. And I think he's doing a pretty good job at them. Now he's trying to pivot to Asia. That's a strategic move. Right. Whether the Middle East lets him do that is another, another question. Romney is certainly trying to keep him pinned down in the Middle East mm -hmm. with the Benghazi attacks and so on, making it a point. But it's the right thing to do to pivot to Asia. Mm -hmm. And I think he's laid out the strategic vision he needs to get to. So because Benghazi's already been mentioned and because it's guaranteed to be mentioned tonight, I, we have to talk about it just a, a little bit. Um, at, uh, this has become a hot, kind of a hot potato in this campaign, which, as the last debate showed, actually has the potential to burn both candidates. And yet they can't seem to um, resist picking it up. Um, uh, Romney, of course, has now two problems with the issue, one because of his um, perhaps ill-advised remarks at the start of the protests, and then his failed gotcha in the last debate. Um, and Obama's problems are, are obvious, uh, the security lapses at the consulate, which um, led to the death of Ambassador Stevens and others, and the seemingly clumsy way the administration stuck to its story about the attacks themselves once in contrary information started to come out. So. Uh, the, the question is, given the administration's missteps and the near certainty that Romney is going to raise them again tonight, um, how should Obama handle the subject and try and put it to bed? I think there's a media answer to this and then there's a substantive answer. I'll try to give both. Um, the media answer being clearly he did, the, uh, Romney did um, what we were saying in the, in the green room, you just don't do in foreign policy. You don't politicize. Wait, that was off the, the record. <laughs> You don't politicize the death of Americans, yeah. and you certainly don't attack embassy officials in the midst of an embassy actually being under attack. These are just things that are verboten in the foreign policy world. And Obama needs to point that out in his, in his media answer. In the substantive answer, the issue is really, while four American deaths are tragic, and while there should have been more security, which in fact, the Republican Congress had a lot more to do with the House and the, and the Congress blocked security funding for our embassies, four deaths does not a foreign policy make. And there are bigger issues that we should be discussing in these debates. And the fact that these four deaths in Libya have overshadowed the Arab Spring, China, North Korea, Iran, all sorts of very important issues 
is ridiculous. And a good president would find some way to point that out in a, in a more thoughtful way than I just did. So that's a, a good segue, because I want to talk about what are the issues that are not going to get mentioned tonight, but really should. Um, what are the elephants, or to be nonpartisan, the elephant and the donkeys um, in the room? <laughs> they had elephant and donkey cookies in the Which you should all have on your table. Dan, you want to take a question? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I blogged about this uh, on Saturday. Uh, um, it, it's ridiculous. Two thirds of the, for, the, the only, if there's only one foreign policy debate, two thirds of it should not be about the greater Middle East. I'm not saying you don't talk about the Middle East. Even half of it or a third of it would be appropriate. But I don't know, maybe something about the Eurozone crisis or Latin America. Mm -hmm. I hear these are important regions. I hear these are important regions to the United States. Maybe we should be talking about those. Do you want to mention your drinking game? Oh, uh, yeah, if you go check my last blog post, uh, I have a, a responsible drinking game. I think one of the problems with a lot of debate drinking games is that basically they're posted, and if you actually follow those rules, you will pass out inside of 15 minutes. You know, we want to drink responsibly, except for you, you're too young. But the rest of us, we all want to drink responsibly, and therefore I've posted a, a debate drinking game where you will probably be pretty happy by the end of the debate, but, you know, otherwise you know, in full possession of your faculty. So the only thing I would have, like, where you had to drink a lot is if, let's say, Africa is mentioned. You know, I mean, come on, let's, let's face it. Um, I think the global economy isn't talked about all mm -hmm. that much. And this is one, one of the problems is that, you know, it gets referenced in the domestic debates, and neither party does this really well, where they talk about, you know, outsourcing to China like it's the worst thing in the world. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, foreign economic policy doesn't get talked. If the Doha round mention, is mentioned, I'll, I will pass out, actually. <laughs> Rachel, do you have anything to add to the list? Uh, you know, I, I think that's exactly it. And with Africa, I would say, if you look at where is our terrorist problem now, yeah. Pakistan and Africa, and yet Africa, there's no way it's going to get mentioned. Right. Um, I want to propose another. Um, David Sanger argued yesterday in the Times that this debate should be about defense spending. And by extension, America's place in the world in this era of, of constrained budgets. Um, do you think that we'll hear anything about that tonight beyond wild promises to dramatically increase uh, Pentagon spending? I would suspect that will, I mean, one of, the, one of the pods or whatever the hell they're calling it is, is America's place in the world. Right. So I suspect that actually will revolve around defense spending. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, whether you're going to have a debate, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Governor Romney has articulated this program of, of boosting defense spending and, uh, you know, particularly on the, the Navy side of things. Because um, his argument will be that, you know, you negotiate through strength and, and the only way you have to be strong is by building up your military. Um, I think we are going to hear that because I mean Barack Obama, one of Barack Obama's lines throughout the last two debates has been about the notion that Governor Romney is proposing two trillion dollars in defense increases that uh, the military neither needs nor wants. Um, so yeah, I actually suspect we will see uh, you know a debate about that. I don't think it's you know the interesting thing is though I don't think it'll be a debate as much about what our defense needs are as that's apparently the one way Republicans can propose to boost government spending. Mm -hmm. um, there's a phrase for it. I think it's called military Keynesianism. Um, and I, you know, the, it's, it's what the Bush administration did, you can argue, in, in 2001, and it's what the Reagan administration did uh, in the early 80s. So in some ways, that's what's being proposed. And yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's funny. I hadn't thought of that as the sort of Republican stimulus is to throw money at you the bet. Pentagon, but it, kind of, it sort of is. Um, I think these two things should actually be separated. It's really a pity that America's place in the world and our military spending are lockstep together mm -hmm. when we all recognize that the way in which America sets its place in the world is all sorts of soft power development, diplomacy, our brand as a country, our immigration policy, which is in shambles and should come up but will not come up, um, all sorts of ways in which we're setting our place in the world. And economics is probably the number one issue that we should talk about, not in terms of just the defense budget, but in terms of if we want to remain a strong power, getting our economic house in order and our debt in order, and so that is number one, should mm -hmm. be at the top of our national security list. And yet the only way it's going to come up is over this sort of side argument about a ridiculous, in my mind, a ridiculous defense spending plan. So a last question. One figure who's been conspicuously absent um, in the debates thus far is the previous president. Um, now, um, one of Obama- I'm Sorry, who is he? Right, exactly. <laughs> we don't mention his name anymore, apparently. Um, but one of the Obama's potential weaknesses, and an attack line um, that Romney could use, is to focus on what's happened in Iraq since the United States left, and what uh, could well and may well happen in Afghanistan um, in 2014. But the question is, can Romney capitalize on these, these issues without associating himself either with 
the last guy um, or with these very unpopular conflicts? Go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> um, well, I, I think Romney is desperately trying to not associate himself with um, George W. Bush. Yeah. And this is hard because a lot of his closest advisors are from the Bush team, Dan Senor and Bolton was on Fox News all day today fighting for Romney. As I flew over here, I got to watch him many, many times. So it's really hard to distance yourself when all of your advisors are from that team and when the Colin Powells and so on are being sidelined and are being kind of pushed off. And even Henry Kissinger is being pushed off to the side. Um, so it's tough, but he's trying to very much. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of the, what you do with Iraq and Afghanistan, these are really problematic situations. I don't think anyone can be happy with what's going on mm -hmm. in any of these places. But look at what happened when the Brit British left um, India and Pakistan. You know, these, these are always tough situations. Whenever you pull out, there's no good way to do it. I'll give you a media answer, and then I'll give you the political answer. The media answer is that um, you know, the way Governor Romney is going to talk about this is to warn what happened the last time the U.S. got out of Afghanistan, which was in the late 80s after you know, supporting the Mujahideen uh, following the Soviet invasion. That led to the sort of toxic environment um, that allowed Al Qaeda to survive and thrive. So, you know, that means that you know if we're going to exit Afghanistan in 2014, it's got to be done in such a way that that doesn't replicate itself. And you can argue it's not clear that the president's strategy has worked. And I actually think this is probably the biggest uh, flaw in the president's strategy. Not, I agree, Benghazi has been completely overblown. I understand politically why, but I mean, substantively, you can argue the president's Afghanistan strategy has not worked, and it's cost a lot in terms of blood and treasure. Um, that said, politically, uh, Governor Romney, I doubt, will say anything to that effect. And the reason is, is that this is one of the few areas where I actually think public opinion has overwhelmed whatever policymakers would want to advise. I think the most telling moment so far of the debates was when Joe Biden um, said categorically that U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan by 2014 no matter what. Mm -hmm. There was a reason he said that. There's often not a reason when Joe Biden says stuff, but in that case, there was a reason that he said it. And the reason was is because he knows that will play incredibly well with the American public. The American public, if you take a look at poll after poll, the Chicago Council poll, the P1, you name it, Americans want U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. They want them out of Iraq, and they probably don't want them in Iran either, although that's a separate issue. Um, so it, I doubt he's going to say anything. You know, He's going to try to do the dance that he's been doing, which is to sound tougher than President Obama without necessarily putting that much daylight in between them on policy. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's open up to questions from the floor. I believe we should have microphones in circulation, so please raise your hand, and when you get the mic, I know, uh, people. stand and give us, uh, <laughs> tell us who you are, and ask a, a short question. The, see one hand in the middle in the back. Yes, you, sir. Hi, Chen Wei Huang from China Daily. You both pointed out uh, the absurdity of the debate. I mean, even it has not has happened yet. And uh, <laughs> if so, why the two candidates uh, want to look absurd before you foreign policy experts? And uh, are they just uh, trying appearing to those swing voters in Ohio? I mean, yes. can you address the questions uh, in specific to their rhetoric on China? How significant, insightful, or ridiculous you know, the rhetorics are of each candidate? Thank you. I mean, especially, I want to say, I mean, Obama talked about a lot about working together with China, I mean, before, during his term, but now he would not say one word about cooperation. All the rhetoric is about confrontation. So is that cooperation, the word poisonous in the campaign? Thank you. Yeah, let's talk about China bashing and whether there's any angle to be had in moving away from it. I mean, even the president engaged in it defensively in the last debate. Well, I think it was Mark Rubio, right, the Republican senator who said, um, yeah who said uh, that Mitt Romney had gone too far in China mm -hmm. bashing and was going to start a trade war. But you're right, Obama has also started doing this. I mean, we are a democracy. And right now we're a democracy in a hunkered down, recessionist, angry mood. And people are looking for people to blame. And I think a lot of that is coming out with China. Now, Obama, Obama has launched more um, trade arguments, or I'm forgetting the technical word for it, but in the WTO, the uh, um, dispute, dispute, trade disputes, dispute, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then I Filings. think any president. Is. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Um, and so there's some real substantive questions we have about how China is carrying out its trade policy, but that's apt to come out in a recessionist era mm -hmm. and an isolationist mood in this kind of bashing, and mm -hmm. that's not helpful. You asked why you know these candidates would risk looking foolish in front of us, the foreign policy community. 
I cannot stress enough how little we matter uh, in terms of the contours of the general election. Um, you know, if you poll Americans, you know, and you ask them, what are you voting based on? Foreign policy comes up maybe 5% total. Um, it's not that important. Now, you want to know the most important thing that Americans are always concerned about? Protecting American jobs. Now, this is not to say that acting tough on trade with China actually protects American jobs. For example, that tire, uh, you know, President Obama in the last debate talked about the action against the, the WTO that, that uh, protected American tire jobs. What he failed to mention is that the Peterson Institute estimated that that action cost $1 million per job saved in the United States. And trust me, the tire makers don't earn a million dollars. So, you know, that, that's one of those instances where it, it doesn't work terribly well. But the fact is, is that, you know, because it sounds good, because it's, you know, because talking tough on China, particularly economically tough on China, you think, oh, that, that kind of resonates. Although the funny thing is, is that I actually think voters over time have become more and more cynical about this. Mm -hmm. I remember there were interviews in 2008, you know, when, when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were trying to get even tougher on NAFTA in Ohio. And there were some great stories from the Ohioans basically saying, yeah, we know this doesn't really matter all that much, but we just like hearing the words. Mm -hmm. um, I think they like hearing the words. And I would also add, by the way, that the Chinese had been quite clear in most of their statements recognizing the fact that this is mostly campaign rhetoric. And they're expecting most of it to subside after November. Um, you know, and it's a credit to them that they actually recognize that fact. Let's take another question. Right here, please. The microphone's right behind you. <laughs> Need all the help I can get. Uh, the prestige of America. Who are you? I'm Carol Lamberg. I, oh, I do housing in New York City. Okay. Uh, and Rachel, my worked first for me boss when ever, she was. Actually. Oh. <laughs> was so this is a setup. Old. Already this yeah. bias, you know. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know Carol was even going to be here. Well but done. The, the, when you go to Europe or Asia and talk to people in professions, the prestige of America is dramatically different from uh, during, uh, I, my grandchildren who live in France ask, said to me, aren't you no longer ashamed to be an American? <laughs> I said I never was ashamed, but that's what you hear again and again. And the president, ha nobody in his campaign has uh, made that point. Uh, is there, are they shy? What's going on? Um, I, I, you want, uh, go ahead and I'll, yeah. Then I'm, yeah. People from overseas don't get to vote in our election, so. That's part of it, although, and, and I should start with, it's wonderful to see you here. I had no <laughs> idea you were going to be here. This is so lovely. Um, but um, so I think that's part of it. I, the polling is actually more diverse than that. Um, well, I wish it weren't. In mm -hmm. the Middle East, for instance, mm -hmm. we're not doing so well. Um, whether anything could make us do so well in the Middle East, it's hard to know. That's a land of a lot of conspiracy kind of politics, but, but we're not doing that great. Um, and in parts of the world where we are doing really well, we have to ask as, as a strategists, what does that get us? And in some cases, it gets us quite a lot. And so I think it really matters. But I think that's really the currency that we're looking for. It's not about the popularity contest. It's can we get other countries to launch sanctions against Iran? Yes, we can now. Can we get other countries to come together and bash some heads together and get some work done in the European zone against the Euro crisis? Yes, finally. We, you know, a little bit happened there. So that's really what we're looking for. So I think it's, it's worthwhile, it's a good currency. You're not gonna hear people talking about it because it doesn't help to say that foreign people like us in our elections necessarily. Um, but I think it's, it's worthwhile and in the, in the eye on the ball is what's it buying us. I think I'll push back on this and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pull out Machiavelli. You know, it's better to be feared than liked. Um, and this is one of those instances where you can argue 2009 was a perfect test for just what soft power gets you. Because you're absolutely right in terms of the data. You know, attitudes about America and Americans went up dramatically um, after Barack Obama was elected and after George W. Bush uh, left. And I actually think, and I've, I mean, I've talked to policymakers on this, I think Barack Obama thought he was gonna get what I like to call the bad boyfriend benefit uh, from becoming president. <laughs> and what I mean by this is that, you know, and I know from personal experience, that if you start dating a woman whose previous relationship, that guy was a total bastard, all you have to be is just a regular, decent human being, and it's awesome. You know? You get, you know, it, it, so it's wonderful that way. And I think Barack Obama thought that because he was so personally popular, he would actually be able to get a lot of policy dividends from that. And I don't think he actually got that many policy dividends. Um, you know, I mean, you can talk about the Iran sanctions, but it's worth pointing out that the Bush administration, during the, the low period of its uh, popularity, got three rounds of United Nations sanctions passed. Um, you know, 
Barack Obama was not able to increase, let's say, NATO contributions to Afghanistan. So I think there are hard and tangible limits on what soft power can get you. I mean, all else equal, do you want to be liked? Of course you do. And I think it probably reduces some of the frictions among some of the allies. But I think one of the big reveals about Barack Obama's election is that it turns out that a lot of our allies didn't do what the United States wanted them to do, not because George W. Bush was president. That was a nice, convenient excuse. They didn't do those things because it wasn't in their interests. Mm -hmm. Next question. This gentleman right here, please. Hi, this Java from uh, Columbia Business School in SIPA. Uh, do you think the issue of the blue on green incidents at, uh, in Afghanistan with Afghan soldiers killing U.S. soldiers will be addressed, or will that be sort of similar to the other issue in Benghazi, sort of a, you know, not in play? You mean during tonight's debate? Mm -hmm. Yes. I I'll repeat the answer I gave before, which is I think it's one of those things where neither candidate necessarily has that vested an in interest to bring it up. I think Governor Romney might bring it up a little bit to talk about how Afghanistan is not working out terribly well. but. Romney cap off, he doesn't have a better solution for this either. So, you know, the problem is, is, and the problem is the American people want the U.S. military out of Afghanistan, period. So it's really a question of what's going to get done in the next two years. And it's not clear to me that there's going to be any kind of change in strategy that would stop that sort of thing, except getting the green out more quickly. Let's take another question. Well, I'll ask one then. <clears throat> Are either candidate going to mention Syria tonight? I mean, this is the, seems to be, talk about elephants in the room. This is a, a burning crisis, and yet um, one that I can imagine um, very little profit from either candidate from mentioning, because it seems as though the, the, the famous CNN effect has almost completely stopped working on the American public, and that's probably because of two uh, uh, and a half wars um, in the Muslim world already. Um, uh, but it seems as though the uh, Obama administration doesn't have much of a policy um, in Syria. And so uh, Romney could uh, make something of it if he chose to, but he has so far uh, chosen not to. Will tonight be any different? I, you, I answered the last. I mean, I'm happy to answer this. Sure, I'll, I'll take a cut. And, yeah, I can go. Um, I think Obama has had a policy on Syria, which has been to very carefully keep us out of it. Mm -hmm. um, whether you like that or not, it is a policy, and it's been pretty hard to walk that policy line um, when you have folks in, in the Senate and the House saying, get in, get out, sometimes the same person saying, get in and get out, like John <laughs> McCain. Um, you know, it can, it can be really tough, but it is a policy. I think um, neither candidate has anything to profit from it. Romney has said, get in more, mm -hmm. give more arms and so on. The New York Times just came out and said a lot of those arms are going to jihadists. We don't have a lot of intelligence that's really good there. We've been trying to push that up more. But what you can actually do in Syria, if we could take mm -hmm. down that regime, I think everybody would agree that that would be terrific if you could take it down and have a strong country there that was not backing Iran and was not giving arms to Hamas and Hezbollah and so on. Fantastic. But that's a lot of ifs. Mm -hmm. And in between here and there, there's no one really to pick up the pieces of Syria and do we want to be mired in a third war in the Middle East with things going on as they are in Iran? So we have a president who's walking an extremely careful and tough line. I think it's a, a decent one. And whether it comes up in the debates, unless Romney wants to try to kind of look tough on it, I, I doubt e either of them will bring it up. The moderator might. I, it's going to come up because if, if they don't bring it up, Bob Schieffer's mm -hmm. going to bring it up. But I mean, I would say, I, I think I have two responses. The first is, I agree with Rachel about what Obama's policy has been. I would, I would add a slight twist to it, which is you can argue that Syria is an example of Obama at his most realpolitik, because it, he, you know, he wants to avoid getting you know, drawn into a quagmire. But the other thing I think he wants, which no one will ever admit publicly, is he's perfectly happy to have Iran drawn into a quagmire fighting, these, you know, fighting the jihadists. That, as far as he can see, is probably a win-win. Now, from a humanitarian perspective, that's an appalling thing to say. From a national interest perspective, that's probably what's going on. It would be interesting, and I don't know if Romney will do this, but it might be interesting if Mitt Romney goes at this from a humanitarian perspective, to say, look, you were talking about intervening in Libya because there were tens of thousands in Benghazi who were at risk of being slaughtered. Tens of thousands in Syria already have been slaughtered, and we're now starting to get to bl the blame for not doing anything, because this is what happens when you're the most powerful country in the world. Even inaction leads to blame. Mm. So you know, the argument could be that we have to do a little more, no nothing like boots on the ground or anything, but at least you know, get some skin in the game in the form of arms transfers to indicate that we actually do have you know, some degree of humanitarian revulsion. That said, 
no, nothing's actually going to happen. And the fact that nothing happened after Syria shelled Turkey is the, the big reveal mm -hmm. on that. That was a great moment if NATO really wanted to actually do something, mm -hmm. and nothing happened. Yes, please. Just wait for the microphone. Can we have a, a mic right here? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both, um, Dan and Rachel. I have a question uh, Just tell for both you. Laura, like Kelly, I'm at the New America Foundation. Um, love both these people. Went to school with one, worked for years with the other, so I'm torn. Um, the, question, <laughs> <laughs> the question I have, um, I spent last Friday at the Quantico at the war, war fighting uh, university there with the Marines, and one of the um, lieutenant or the colonels who had run Anbar province stood up and said, I have to tell you, the center of gravity in Anbar was relationships. And anybody who's worked with the military knows that their whole thought leadership is about social resilience. And they also say that for the United States, it's about connective infrastructure, education, health, transportation. I'm wondering, do you see uh, your candidates getting this? And fundamentally, the sequestration fight is pitting resilience against the Cold War right now with the spending. Um, do, do Mitt Romney and Barack Obama get this? I mean, it's our own military saying this now, that social capital is our future. Um, so I, I work, uh, I'm on the board, I should admit, of um, Dave Kilcullen's, one of the subsidiary analytic intelligence companies of a company run by Dave Kilcullen, who's one of the guys who um, has done a lot of counterinsurgency thinking. Of, um, and. So completely separate from that, the whole point of that is to say I'm not speaking on any of that. Um, the, the coin strategy and the social capital strategy and getting into these countries in a deep way I think is smart and right and absolutely not suited to how the United States makes war. And I don't know if we can ever do it well. And this is not a political argument. I don't think either of the candidates yeah. is saying anything yeah. about this, frankly. But um, if you want to do that strategy, you need the British Civil Service, where 5,000 highly educated people stay on the ground for 20 years and really learn it and build a lot of social capital. We have an op tempo where you're there for a year and then you're out. And that's a long time. I don't want to be shot at for a year. And if I'm a civilian, I don't want, want to be there for, you know, they get long breaks and rest and relaxation because of the just incredible level of post traumatic stress within the Truman Project. We deal with this a lot with members of the Truman Project. And so, I see it firsthand. I think if you want to fight that kind of war, it's probably the best way to fight an insurgency, and I don't know if our country can do it, but it's certainly not anything that anyone's talking about. Yeah, I would say two things. The first is, is that the ideal way in which you deal with war fighting is to avoid those kinds of conflicts in the first place. Not, I'm not disagreeing with you, obviously, in, in terms of what happens once you're involved in that kind of conflict, but presumably avoiding them is the best way to deal with that. But I think the second thing is, is that your comment isn't just about the military. If anything, the comment, what it should be about is the civilian side of things. And here I'm going to play shamelessly to this audience. You know, the problem is, is that far too many resources in terms of the foreign policy budget is devoted to the military and not to the civilian side of how you conduct foreign policy. If we learn nothing from Benghazi, it's that we should have learned that, in fact, that it's America's diplomatic corps that is now at the front line and most vulnerable to terrorist attacks. And therefore, the only way we're going to be able to conduct a smart foreign policy is not by retreating in response to those things, but by making sure we have more people on the ground, not boots on the ground. We need, high, you know, wingtips on the ground. We need, you know, uh, you know, more shoes that would you blend in. You get the point. Um, you know, we need to have more, a, a more, you know, robust civilian presence. I think one of the interesting things is, and this is a depressing statement. If you remember, prior to 2008, all the presidential candidates published articles in Foreign Affairs saying what their strategy would be. And what was striking was across the board, it didn't matter which party they were from, all of them basically said something like, "We need a civilian martial corps or some civilian equivalent of the military in order to bolster, you know, the civilian side of things." You have not seen a word of that this time around. If there's anything that Benghazi should have taught us, it's that. We need to have a much more robust civilian presence elsewhere in the world. There's a question here at the second table, please. Um, okay. uh, Maha Atal um, from many places, but mostly Forbes. Uh, the question is about Russia, uh, which is an issue that's not in any of the segments, but is actually something that the Romney campaign through various PACs, and I think the Republican Party through various PACs, is actually advertising on. I've seen a number of ads floating around where either the GOP or the Romney PACs are attacking the Obama administration for being soft in the reset and the START treaty, et cetera. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's a way in which that comes up, because that's one of those issues that I think 
the American people still care about the Russia mm-hmm. bogeyman. Well, is Romney going to tell us that Russia is our enemy? I think if he's smart, he'll just have a little YouTube clip of Rocky IV that he'll play uh, as a way of, you know, trying to get people in the right mindset in terms of, of how they should think about this. I mean, you know, I, it, okay, I'll take off the Romney hat. I, you know, I don't understand what the hell he was saying when it comes to the, the Russia's, uh, you know, our number one geopolitical foe. But if I'm going to make the argument from the Romney perspective, I would say that, you know, Look, if nothing else, presumably what Barack Obama said is we're going to somehow normalize our relations with Russia. We're going to, you know, shower them with goodwill. We're going to say we're going to sign another arms treaty, which really benefits them, you know, far more than it benefits us. And what have we gotten from it? Now, we clearly got something on Afghanistan, Mm -hmm. which isn't going to matter after 2014. Besides that, we've basically gotten the most passive aggressive, you know, leadership out there. And, 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 you know, a country that even if they're not powerful in and of themselves, actually acts as sort of a focal point for a lot of anti-Americanism in the rest of the world. Um, And so, you know, this suggests that maybe that reset isn't working and we need to rethink our approach towards Russia in a way that, let's say, doubles down on promoting democratization. If we learn nothing from the last four years, it's that there actually is a strong, you know, groundswell for democracy even in Russia. And this is another area where potentially Mitt Romney could attack Barack Obama saying, you know, he didn't say anything during the green, you know, movement in Iran. And he didn't say all that much in terms of, you know, when what was going on in Moscow. And so there needs to be greater democracy promotion. And we need to tell countries that don't share our values, we're going to be pushing our values on you. Um, so I would actually agree with the greater democracy promotion in Russia, but in a very different way. I think one of the things that <laughs> yeah, we enough. saw with the neoconservative kind of rah-rah democracy is that it gets a lot of people killed. Um, A lot of people who go out there fight for us, and then we don't actually back them up. There's a great book out, um, and I think he might not have written for Foreign Affairs, so I apologize. It happens. But um, Will Dobson has a book called The Dictator's Learning Curve, where he looks at all these. He was an editor editor here. Oh, sorry. So that was a shout out. We can claim it. Thank you. One of ours. My predecessor. Um, But Will's book on on the dictator's learning curve goes through all these dictatorships and what they're learning and how you really promote democracy in them. And we need to get a lot smarter about it because Russia, for instance, has kicked out all of our people who yep. would be de- promoting democracy, so we can't do it the old-fashioned way. Is Russia the greatest geopolitical? F- no, no. I mean, even Colin Powell, you know, had the think mitt moment where, um, but they're not helpful. And um, what have they done for us? I would say the biggest thing they've done is either stood aside or helped with Iran. And that's been big. And they have not hurt us in Afghanistan. And they could have treated Afghanistan the way we treated Afghanistan during their war there which was to pull them deeper and deeper in and arm the other side. They haven't done that. So those are big things, really big things that have saved lives. Um, But we should be pushing harder on the democracy. We just need to be a lot smarter and learn how to do it better. And they've also been thoroughly unhelpful on Syria. That should be Mm -hmm. the point. Yes, they have a lot of interest there. Yeah. Question right here, please. Mike Darum, I'm with the Truman Project, but I uh, actually want to tee off on a uh, Dr. Dresden's post from, uh, from Saturday. Um, th- there's been a lot of discussion about parts of the world that are not included in the foreign policy debate, and Latin America and, and Sub-Saharan Africa are a big part of that. But I realize the debates are all about rhetoric, but rhetoric aside, is there any real daylight between the uh, positions of the two uh, candidates on our attitude towards Latin America and Africa? I mean, in some ways, this speaks to the problem of we don't know what these candidates' position are on these right. countries, you know, on these regions, because they haven't talked about it at all, you know, during the debates or dur- during the speeches. Um, I would argue that potentially, you can argue from Latin, from a Latin American perspective, Governor Romney might be more interested in engaging with Latin America. I thought it was a very sort of subtle thing where he talks about his five-point plan, and one of his points is promoting free trade areas. In the the second debate, he started talking about particularly free trade areas with Latin America, which I find. Look, you know, that's not nothing, and that's actually pretty significant, you know, for them. He signed agreements negotiated by George W., the president that shall not be named, I'm sorry. Um, You know, and he hasn't, and the other thing is he's actually been extremely slow in promoting any other kind of regional or hemispheric integration. Um, So presumably, you know, and the other thing that that Governor Romney has talked about is the notion of, you know, an energy independent North America, which presumably has to involve Mexico, because I hear they have oil there. Um, so, you know, you can argue that at least he's made slight inflections towards talking about Latin America. But that said, to be fair, neither of them have talked about it, you know, all that much. And so, uh, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why it's frustrating that it's not being brought up in this debate. We have time for a couple more questions. The woman all the way in the back, please. I 
Sari Norley. Um, I work for an ed tech startup, and I'm a Truman Project National Security Fellow. I didn't plan. Did you stab? I was going to say this is <laughs> bad form, Rachel. That's why I'm saying the best. Sorry, you can just not identify yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Ed tech startup. So obvious. Um, my question is for, for both of you: How has President Obama's soft power approach been affected by his failure to close Gitmo and also um, the civilian casualties? associated with drone attacks, particularly in Pakistan? Um, I'll start with that one. Thanks. Uh, this, this is probably the, I mean, it's the biggest, we have a question on our Truman Project questionnaire, what's the biggest thing of this administration that you disagree with? And that's the number one thing that people bring up um, for obvious reasons, it's a real stain. And it was actually a Truman Project person who had the job of closing Bitma right, right when this president took, took over. Um, and so I talked with him quite frequently about that job and the real, shame of it is that it was very, very hard to get other countries to take these terrorists or these supposed terrorists or these maybe terrorists. It was god awfully hard. I remember teasing this particular person um, because a couple of the terrorists got placed in a South Pacific island. And I thought that was kind of funny. And I teased him a little bit about it. And I've never seen him so mad at me because it was months and months and months of this person's life to get these two or three folks placed in this island. Um, it was a campaign promise the president really wanted to keep. I think he really meant it. There was a lot of pressure right away to do it. And it turns out that getting people who might be really bad people and might not be really bad people placed in other countries where they're not from those countries, and hopefully those countries don't torture them, is, is really tough. Um, I would say two things on this. The first is, is that in some ways the, the the Gitmo question is actually, I think, both shows the, the weaknesses that I talked about of Obama's soft power, but also, to be fair, the strengths. So this actually might be the one area where I think Obama's personal popularity has helped, which is the fact that he hasn't closed Guantanamo hasn't really been that big of an issue outside of the United States. I mean, what's interesting is that while Gitmo was this sort of stain on the Bush administration, you know, from what I read, yeah, I mean, it's not like people are happy that it's still <coughs> open, but you don't see the same kind of outrage that existed during the Bush administration. And I have to say that was probably due to the fact that now it's Barack Obama who's president as opposed to the president who shall not be named. With regard to the drone strikes um, and the civilian casualties, I would say two things. On the one hand, obviously, I mean, this, you know, I, th I think it's a, a great issue and I, it I would, it would love for it to be brought up tonight. It won't be. And even if it does, they're going to, you know, outbid each other to say who can sound tougher in terms of drone strikes. That said, I mean, I know part of this is being driven by that report that just got issued, I think, last month about the, uh, uh, the polling of people who have said, you know, massive loss of life and outrage in Pakistan about this. But I think it's, it should be pointed out that while that study, I think, needs to be dealt with with proper respect, what's interesting is what hasn't happened because of the drone strikes, which is you haven't seen massive outflows of, of you know, um, of refugees coming from, let's say, Pakistan's <coughs> Swat Valley as a result of the drone strikes, which you did see when the Pakistan military went in, which was one of the other ways of presumably dealing with these kind of, of, of terrorist situations. You know, one of the facts about foreign policy is, is that sometimes you're trying to figure out which strategy is the best of a truly horrible bad set of options. Um, and you can argue that this is one of those instances, and actually I, I highly recommend if you haven't seen Argo yet, uh, the movie, it, it's actually a great line in there where the, the guy says, this is without question the best bad idea we've got. In some ways you can argue drones are the best bad idea that exist with respect to dealing with these terrorists, which is you're absolutely right, there's collateral damage but I'm not sure there's a better approach. And until you show me a better approach, I think you have to stick with what seems to be working. And you think the public understands that? I think the American public doesn't care. Mm -hmm. I, I truly cannot stress how little they care about this issue. The global public is a separate issue. And I think part of the, you know, I think one of the reasons you've seen a decline of Obama's popularity elsewhere hasn't, doesn't have much to do with Gitmo. I think it does have something to do with the drone strikes mm -hmm. a little bit. And the drone strikes, just to, to piggyback, there's some very interesting public polling in Pakistan that, um, the, the public near the areas where the drone strikes are happening, if you're, if you're right in the area, then you tend to be very against them. Um, those tend to be areas where clearly there's a lot of, of extremists that we're trying to root out. If you're in the suburbs of those areas, people are very for them. And if you're in the cities, they're very against them again. And that's a very interesting set mm -hmm. of public opinion. What it shows is that you've got kind of your urban elites who have an anti-America feeling from these drone strikes. You have the local extremists who have a very anti-America feeling from these drone strikes. And then you have a sort of group of people around those areas that don't necessarily want to be the next 14-year-old um, pulled off a bus and, and shot. Yeah. And they're pro. And that's a difficult situation, and I agree with Dan's answer about that. Any last questions? Let's take these two together. You first, and then you, please. 
Jim Cooper, CNN. Um, I, also have, I also have a daytime talk show that you guys should check out. It's pretty awesome. Um, Obama would always say, at least up until recently, that the thing that kept him awake at night was Pakistan. Do you agree with that? And in the next four years, will it still be Pakistan, or will it all of a sudden turn into Iran? And let's take this question, and then you can answer them together. Um, speaking as a killing shulk, uh, as a my hometown was El Paso, Texas, and I'm always struck by the fact that no one speaks about what's happening in Mexico and how the drug war is basically making Colombia. Any comments? Colombia, Pakistan. Um, I just came from Mexico City like two days ago, so this gives me credibility when I talk about this issue. Um, you know, the, the <laughs> I always love it when that happens at like investment. Con I, I, I've been to investment conferences where literally the game is, how recently were you in China? You know, I was in Shanghai, th you know, 12 hours ago, so I can tell you exactly what's going on. Um, with respect to the drug war, I think the drug war is, again, one of those issues where they're not going to want to talk about it because they don't have any disagreements with it, and it's not a comfortable topic for either of them. So uh, it's one of those things where I hate to de you know, depress you, but it's not going to come up with this debate. I seriously doubt it. As to Pakistan, whether or not that's going to be the thing that he, you know, are you worried about more than Iran, let me go out of the box here. I can't believe I just said that. Jesus. Um, <laughs> I guarantee you that, it, first of all, it probably isn't going to be Iran. Iran is a traditional state threat. And actually, the United States is actually reasonably good at, at figuring out how to deal with traditional state threats. Um, Pakistan is a somewhat more complicated threat because it's, it's a threat that's born out of weakness rather than one out of strength. Um, and I have to say, one of the disturbing things, and this is something that's not often talked about, one of the odder effects of the Osama bin Laden strike is that it's caused dramatic changes in the way that Pakistan you know, has command and control of its nuclear structure, which is it's created all of these mobile nuclear weapons because it's now deathly afraid that the United States is going to come in. Except in doing so, it's made those nuclear weapons extremely vulnerable to attack by either, you know, Pakistani Taliban or other, you know, extremist elements within Pakistan. Yeah, that gives me some, some pause. I'm a little scared about that. That said, my hunch is, is that whatever the next big threat is, you know, after 2012, is going to be a country that will not be mentioned at all during this debate. Because that's how life works. It's things that we don't think about. Um, and that's why it's so frustrating that the two-thirds of it is going to be about the Middle East. In all likelihood, there's going to be some country, you know, maybe Mali, maybe somewhere else, that no one is going to mention at all that will actually be, you know, the heart of the next sort of big conflagration. Do you want to add anything? Um, sure, two, two quick points. I think that the Mexican issue and the drug war, I mean, what we've created is a balloon where you push on one end and it pops up somewhere else and you push yeah. on the other end. This is not going to go away until we figure out the, the um, demand side rather than the supply side, and that has to do with legalization. Now, I happen to be extremely anti-drug. I was a straight-edge punk in high school, and I've got <laughs> multiple security clearances. But um, it, that's the name of the game. And until we actually admit that and start dealing with that, we're going to have this yeah. problem all over Latin America and now over the rest of the world. Um, with Pakistan, it sure keeps me up at night. Um, I'm not the president. He's probably got a lot of things on his mind. Um, but I, I completely agree with Dan. It's, it's fragile, weak states that fester things that we don't know. It could be a disease outbreak that's yeah. the next big thing. That's what I would be most worried about, frankly, right now. You have these... A weak um, China is actually my biggest fear. That's also a huge fear. Weak yeah. China, zoonotic outbreaks of you know, diseases that move from animals to humans. Those tend to come from the Congo and places like the middle of Africa. Sort zombies. Of places. <laughs> Dan's written about zombies. They're, you know... A, a oh, that's right. Yeah, a specific no. <laughs> problem. Um, <laughs> But I would actually be looking at weak populist states, and Pakistan is one of them, and it's nuclear arms, so it's a real problem. Nigeria is another I'd mm. be looking at. Um, but weak populist states are things we don't know how to deal with. Problems metastasize. Multiple problems happen at once. And particularly if they're democracies, they're, you know, there's a lot of politics going on that makes it hard. So. Well, I don't know about all of you, but I, am, I have to say I'm highly distressed by the amount that our two so-called surrogates uh, agreed with each other during the course of this debate. <laughs> that being said, I'm delighted by the amount of intelligence that they brought to bear. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs> <laughs>